Revelation chapter 14. Let's look together at verses 1 through 5. The word says, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, the Lamb central to Revelation, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They follow the lamb wherever he goes, and they were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Wow, so much to unpack here. A lot of symbolism used here. Again, this is a great celebration in the presence of the Lamb. And regardless of what is transpiring in the kingdom of darkness at this point, this is the reality for those who carry the Father's name. And this is the reality that they, we must focus on. So let's break this down um, phrase by phrase, so to speak. I love to read this, Revelation chapter 14, these verses against the backdrop of Psalm 2. So I want to go to Psalm 2 now and read to you and see if you hear some of the similarities. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. There it is. The other mention of Zion, the holy mountain, the king, the lamb being installed. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance. There's another very important tie in to Revelation chapter 14, which is going to speak of the nations as that inheritance. The ends of the earth, your possession. The lamb is meant to rule them all. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the son, kiss his son, or he will be angry and your way will lead you to destruction for his wrath can flare up in a moment. A lot of, a lot of similarities, a lot of imagery here in Psalm 2 that's repeated in chapter 14. This great gospel is being proclaimed in Revelation chapter 14 for the nations of all people, tribes, languages. And there's an opportunity given for repentance. And then there's this mention of the wrath of the Lord. And the call is strong. Turn unto the Lord. Turn to the Father so that your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. So I love to see this victorious Messianic Psalm 2 paired up with Revelation chapter 14, a promise for all of the nations. Psalm 2 says, Psalm 2 verse 6 says that the Lamb is the King. I have installed my King on Zion, my holy mountain. All around are enemies, rulers that have banded together against the Lord and against his anointed, but the Lamb is installed as King by the Lord Almighty, by the Father. Mount Zion is a symbol for the kingdom of the Messiah, and it's used figuratively throughout the Old Testament of both the people of God and the city of God, Jerusalem. If you look at Psalm 74, Psalm 78, Psalm 125, you'll see that Mount Zion is used of God's dwelling place in a, in a larger sense over and over and over again. 
And if you look in Isaiah, it's often applied in the Old Testament to Jerusalem as the city of God's people, God's dwelling place, the temple being there. Now in the New Testament, it's very interesting. Mount Zion is only used two times. Once here in Revelation chapter 14, and then another time in Hebrews chapter 12. And it's being contrasted in Hebrews chapter 12 with the Mount Zion of the Old Testament, the physical city of Jerusalem, the, the place where the sacrifices used to be offered, but Jesus came to offer a better way, a more complete way. And if we read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 24, this is the other time that Mount Zion is specifically mentioned in the New Testament, and it gives us a description and several synonyms for Mount Zion. And this is really key. It states in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion. In other words, not to the Zion of before, before Jesus. You have come to a new Mount Zion. You have come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church. You have come to the church, the church of the firstborn. So there's a tie in here with Mount Zion and the church of the firstborn, the church of those who have been born again in Jesus unto new life, whose names are written in heaven. Do you see the tie in here to Revelation chapter 14, the name written on the on the forehead of each one, the names written in heaven. You have come to God, Hebrews 12 goes on to say, the judge of all. Do you see the judgment? To the spirits of the righteous made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. This is new covenant language here, not old covenant language. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Do you see the contrast? There's the Mount Zion of old, and there's the Mount Zion of now in the kingdom of God. That refers to the city of the living God, yes, but it's the dwelling place of the church of God. It's the church of the firstborn. It's where everyone praises the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And this is very key to understanding what's happening here in Revelation chapter 14. So two mentions of Mount Zion in the New Testament, very key, Hebrews 12 verses 22 through 24. It's a new thing that we're speaking of here. It's not an old thing. And then in Revelation chapter 14. So let's look back again at Revelation 14, 1 through 5. So we have the lamb who is central. And N.T. Wright calls those who surround the lamb here in great song. They're singing a new song before the throne. He calls them elite warriors. So 144,000. Now, it's because they're elite warriors that John speaks of them as virgins. This is figurative language, obviously. It's a symbol for being ready for battle. In ancient Israel, there was a clear policy about going to war. If war was justified, then war was holy. And those who fought in it had to be made holy for the battle. And so they had to obey special rules of purity, including abstention for the time from sexual relations. So this is an imagery here reflecting that Old Testament practice of being set apart, being holy. So what does it mean that these 144,000 had not defiled themselves with women, that they had remained virgins? It simply means they were pure. They were set apart spiritually for the purposes of God. Now, these 144,000, I want you to think back. These are the 144,000 that we met in Revelation chapter 7. So let's just review a minute what we learned about the 144,000 from chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 4 says, Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. And most readers of Revelation agree that the list of people who are Sealed in this way in verses 4 through 8 of Revelation refers to the same people who are then immediately after described as a great uncountable crowd in Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 17. So 
um, just as we uh, often see in Revelation that John will hear and then he'll turn and see in Revelation chapter 7, he heard that the number was 144,000 and then 144,000 and then he turned and he saw that it was a great uncountable crowd. So again, some um, symbolism going on here. John was using that rich symbolism of Israel's identity to mark out those who through the Messiah now belong to God's renewed and rescued people, no matter what their ancestry was. Look back at N.T. Wright, what he has to say on page 47 of our study guide to refresh your mind a little bit. I know that these videos have been rolled out slowly, so sometimes I even forget. I have to go back and remind myself what we have already discussed. But focusing in again on Revelation 14 verses 1 through 5, this is a picture of our conquering king, the lamb, and his faithful followers. And instead of the mark of the beast, the name of God and the lamb, those names are on their foreheads. This, this is not the total sum of all believers, but what John calls in this passage, the first fruits. In other words, the beginning, the advanced sign of an even greater harvest to come. So just by calling them the first fruits, it gives us hope to know that there's a greater number. There's a much greater number that will be represented, that will be found in heaven when the complete harvest is brought in. Now, these warriors, as we said, these elite warriors um, are dedicated to holy living. They are blameless through the blood of the lamb, not because of their own efforts. They sing a, a new song. It's a unique song. It's a song of redemption before the throne. And it's a song that only the redeemed can sing. It's interesting here that they're singing, but the four living creatures and the elders are listening. So no one could learn the song, it says, except the 144,000. Do you see how special our salvation is? How unique it is to the, the human that God, the human life, the mankind that God created uh, in his image. We are the redeemed ones, the ones, the ones for whom he gave the lamb. So they sing a unique song, a song of redemption before the throne. It's a new song, a glorious song of praise to the lamb who is standing with them. Isn't that beautiful? He is standing with them. The lamb is there. And the host of heaven is the audience. The lamb receives the worship, the host of heaven, the angels, the four living creatures, the elders are witnesses to the song of redemption. Over and over again in Revelation, we have said how great a salvation, how great a salvation is this salvation that the lamb has brought. The lamb and his leap elite warriors are winning this victory. Don't lose sight of that at this point in Revelation chapter 14. And these elite warriors follow the lamb in holiness of life. So what a contrast to the dragon's whole system, to Satan's system, which is based on lies, a world of untruth, a fake world, a sham system, if you will, from the top to the bottom. But for these elite warriors, no lie is found in their mouths. No lie, verse 5 says, is found in their mouths. Following the lamb means rejecting the lie of the world system of the enemy. So Revelation 14, 1 through 5, paints a beautiful picture around the throne before the lamb with these 144,000 representing the redeemed and the Lord singing a new song. When we move from verses 1 through 5 to verses 6 through 8, we see a transition here. We're transitioning from the picture of the coming triumph of God's people to the pouring out of the seven bowls of judgment upon the earth. So in verse 6, Revelation 14 says, then I saw another angel flying midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. And here it is. Remember back from Psalm 2? to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, 
and the springs of water. So this is the first angel, again, preaching the eternal gospel to every nation, tribe, language, and people. A theme over and over that we see in Revelation. We see it in chapter 7, verse 9. We see it in chapter 11, verse 9. And we see it in chapter 13, verse 7. And here again in chapter 14, verse 6. Every nation, tribe, language, and people. This is God's focus. This is his heart. This is most likely here in verses six and seven, a final worldwide, worldwide appeal to all people to recognize the one true God, a world, a people without excuse then, because over and over again, God is wooing and has wooed and has drawn and has cried out and has laid out his plan and given people an opportunity to repent. So the angel's words here um, in verse 8, the next angel, the second angel, his words are a prediction. The actual fall of the city would not occur until the judgment of the last bowl is described, um, is poured out as described in Revelation chapter 16. So we'll get there, um, but right now the angel is predicting this fallen Fallen is Babylon the Great, which made all nations drink of the maddening wine of her adulteries. Now, this is another important symbol, the symbol of Babylon. To get the force of this symbol, we really have to um, think of the history. Babylon is used here in Revelation chapter 16 through 18, really as the picture, the paradigm of wickedness and idolatry and immorality and really sheer cruelty, um, which was a symbol of Rome in John's time, the Roman Empire. If you look back in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, you see that the Israelites were in exile in Babylon and they'd almost given up hope. Babylon came to be a symbol of a place of captivity, a place of darkness, a place of, um, of chains and bondage, a place from which they and we need deliverance. If you look at Isaiah 52, there are several verses here that, that speak to God's saving power for those who are in captivity in Babylon. Chapter 52 of Isaiah verse 7 proclaims the good news um, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. So the good news that we're talking about being proclaimed certainly is the good news for your personal salvation, but it's much bigger than that even. It's much larger in scope. The message here, as in Isaiah 52, is your God reigns, not just in your life, but over all the world. Your God reigns. Your God reigns. That's the good news. And then in Isaiah 52, verse 8, there's the second part of the good news. Listen, it says, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. When the Lord returns to Zion... This is the second part of the good news. Your Lord, your God is returning for you. Your God is coming back. And it's not going to be secret. It says right here, they will see it with their own eyes. They will see it. It will be public. It will be obvious. They will see it with their own eyes. And then thirdly, God is doing a powerful and public work of rescue. Chapter 52 of Isaiah, verse 10 states, The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. The salvation of our God. All the ends of the earth will see it. God is doing a public work of rescue. This is that great salvation that has been proclaimed from the beginning of time. Genesis 3.15, all the way through the end of Revelation. Our God saves and our God reigns. Revelation 14, verses 6 through 8, 
announces this good news and announces that the kingdom of darkness cannot withstand it. Babylon the Great is fallen. And although it's not yet a reality, it is already a done deal. It, is all, it has already been accomplished through the work of Jesus on the cross. And his return will just be the implementation of the work that he's already completed. So fallen is Babylon the Great. So check out N.T. Wright's study guide on page 82. And he kind of gives a recap of this. The good news from chapter 14, verse 7. God the creator is at last going to sort everything out. Verse 8. Babylon is fallen. After all of her efforts to make the nations drink from that immoral wine, Babylon is fallen. And let's look at verses 9 through 11. Because thirdly, God's judgment is coming, it will be just, it will be thorough, and it will be complete. So Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength, full strength into the cup of his wrath. God's not holding back. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast in its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. The background for these verses is Jeremiah chapters 50 through 51. Jeremiah had spent most of his life in the terror and the horror of the Babylonian invasion and its aftermath. Deep, deep sorrow in his life, throughout his life. Chapters 50 through 51 of Jeremiah are two long chapters of sustained condemnation of Babylon. And it foreshadows the final condemnation of the world system and Satan's reign and tiny little puny kingdom that seems to have grown beyond imagination sometimes in this world. But it will come to an end and it will face complete destruction and judgment. So the background for this judgment against Babylon is Jeremiah chapters 50 through 51. When Jesus spoke of hell, he used the word Gehenna to describe it. He repeatedly warned that hell would be a fate far worse than physical death, a place where one is utterly alone, rejected by one's creator because the creator was rejected by that one. God is not going to force himself on us. And excluded, ultimately, from God's presence. You can read about that more in Matthew chapter 25, verses 41 through 43. In Luke chapter 13, verses 24 through 28. And you can read more about this, a similar description of hell, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. This is the final end. This is the final judgment against Babylon. Verses 12 through 13, and we're going to stop here for now, but verses 12 through 13 kind of answer the question for believers, wow, so what does this mean for us? Well, verse 12 says, this calls for patient endurance on the part of God's people, on the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. So we've seen this great picture painted in the throne room with the 144,000 redeemed of the Lord, worshiping the Lamb. And we've seen the picture, the contrasting picture that's about to unfold in the next upcoming chapters of Revelation of the destruction of Babylon and the judgment, the full wrath of God poured out. So what does it mean? What should we do? We need to patiently endure. We need to keep God's commands. We need to remain faithful to Jesus. We need to walk in purity. 
in verse 13, then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who died in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. So our story ends quite differently from those who are outside of Christ, from those who never worship the lamb. Our story ends differently. So may we persevere, endure patiently, walk faithfully with the Lord our God. Next time we'll take up the rest of Revelation chapter 14. And until then, enjoy your study. And it's so great to have this time with you, even virtually online, as we continue to study Revelation. <laughs>